preservation probably was a major issue in the Stevenson household, as it has been ever since people decided they were going to live longer than the next season. So uh, they decided people that had been worrying from early on about how they were going to keep a food supply since if you didn't live in a climate where you could grow food year-round, you had to do something to provide for the sort of the off-season. Some of the earliest things that people preserved, or pe methods that people used for preservation, were drying and fermenting. We had found from, you, from looking into ancient civilizations that one of the first things people did was make beer, good people. And they discovered that if they ground up wheat, then they could make pasta. That's a very fairly early form of food preservation. But fermentation was one that came along early on. I don't know who stumbled across it, but they must have been but just a brilliant person. <laughs> Brought joy to humanity for centuries since. But anyway, um, time went along, and people were preserving things by drying them, pickling them. People had uh, used to would dig a trench, put vegetables that tended to last longer, like cabbages and whatnot, in the trench, cover it with, with uh, canvas straw and make it mounted up and have kind of a, a winter supply underneath that canvas. They'd just pull it back and hopefully some of the stuff, they'd have some loss, but they, they'd have enough so they could get by. But that was, that's always been a perpetual problem. This is my anachronistic. There's a trash can right there. You can put it in that bucket. Why not artistic trash? Anyway, um, the thing kind of came to a head. The food preservation or canning as we know it today is basically the result of the Napoleonic Wars. Napoleon was marching off here, there, and the other thing, and everybody's heard the expression, an army marches on its stomach. So one of Napoleon's biggest problems was to provide food for his troops when they did build <laughs> ill-conceived notions like in pay Russia in the wintertime. But, uh, they, they did need to prepare food. So the French government offered a prize of considerable sum of money to somebody that could come up with a canning method. So we think of canning, of course, in glass containers or ceramic containers, but the first actual canning cans, as we know it, were made out of cast iron. And they were sort of ovoid, sort of football-shaped objects that they had the canned food inside of it, inside of them. And this, I'm not making this up, this is your government at work for you, except <laughs> it was the French government at work for you. They invented the canning, and these guys went out for their, you know, M, what it called, MREs, reels right. made, MREs. Right. Fine, in this little iron container with their food in it. However, the can opener had not been invented. <laughs> so in order to, so in order to eat their meal, ready to eat, they had to bayonet it. So, this is the trick. This was the first, this guy won this prize for developing this uh, fabulous candy method. But obviously that was not a good answer to the, every time you had to bayonet your food. So, things pro progressed along and they tried other metal containers. Of course, sometimes they did foolish things like sealing them with lead. Right. So a number of people died of lead poisoning from having eaten food in containers that were sealed with lead. Um, in fact, lead poisoning sort of brought or about the semi brought about the decline of the Roman Empire because they piped water into Rome in lead pipes. So that wasn't real good for your health. Anyway, things progressed along, and by the time we run into Stevenson in this country. They had developed um, different kinds of containers. They had ceramic containers like this that could be sealed either with wax or a cloth, and um, and and then cloth over the top, and then wax. And uh, they did preserve some food products using grease as the sealant. If they did, for instance, that they butchered late in the fall, early winter. It, theoretically, it would be cold enough so that the fat that they would put on the top would form the seal to the thing. I'm not sure that uh, I would recommend doing that, but you know, people did with what they had to, they had to do. So, and uh, sometimes paper was used as a seal, as a cover too, and then sealed with, with wax around the side. But the 
things that we're going to talk about today are another really good way of preserving food. It's probably the low tech, lowest tech of all is drying. You can dry things out and you're running a pretty low risk of contamination and food poisoning. One of these other things where you had container, you're running a bigger risk of actually creating an environment for the things to spoil in. But one of the things that we show the children is how people used to make what they called leather breeches beads. We can all try it if you want to. All you do is, uh, I brought some string beans here. Now this is what we do with green beans. We have them preserved in glass. But years ago, in order to use the drying technique, you'd string them on a string and hang them by the fire and let them dry out, which is why they were called leather breeches beans. They're not of a particularly appealing texture, but the kids, when the school tours are here and the kids look at them and kind of, you know, curling their lips back, I said, well, you know, you have to consider what it would have been like in February here when there was nothing else around, and if you put an onion, which you probably would have still had, and a piece of salt pork, and this in a pot and boil it up, probably wasn't too bad. And it sure as heck was better than nothing. So, this is what we do, and if you're going to do a school tour, why don't you come over here and we can do this together. If, if we can, uh, here, Lisa, you're a thread person. You want to thread that up? I can thread. You can thread, and we can make some leather bridges beans. We can each take a turn. And I'll save half in case somebody comes back later for another little session here. And I probably better find you scissors here. I mean, the, the, I've done that even with little bitty, you know, even first graders. You just have to admonish them uh, about the, you know, not stabbing themselves <laughs> in the figure. And usually the mothers are, are good about helping. And I think it is important for the kids to know how these things were actually done. So I think the hands-on with that is a pretty good idea. And the kids see that when you first string them, they don't look like these rubbery things you end up with. So I tell the children, why, why do you think, what, what, makes, what makes them change? What, what goes out of the bean when they're green like that to make them all shriveled up like this? So the kids eventually come up with the water comes out of it, so they dry up. And so the con hey, the, Oh. So, <laughs> see, we have an expert Team here. Team so um, then the, the obvious question is, how do you get the beans, how do you reconstitute the beans? So if you took water out to dry them, how do you reconstitute them? Well, the kids eventually decide that you have to put water back in them. So that's, that's kind of a hydration, dehydration kind of, kind of lesson. Well, we, we dried things and we did them in the you bury them in the ground like we talked about, but another way of uh, preserving food is to pickle them. Now when you look in the records of Stevenson's purchases the first year that he lived in the house, you know, one of the things that he bought in huge quantities were apples. And when we first started looking at the records, we were thinking, man, they must have really liked apple pie or applesauce, and I started to think about it, and I thought, the one, one of the reasons why they would have bought so many apples was to make vinegar. Cider. Oh, vinegar. Well, okay. Okay, I'm sure they need cider too. Yep. But um, vinegar is an odd thing that's a fermentation process too because it starts out with mother of vinegar, mm -hmm. which probably reminds us of several of our relatives. <laughs> mother of vinegar, no. Um, <laughs> anyway, the mother of vinegar the, makes it for, helps form the, the the vinegar, it's the same fermentation process, again, it's beer and wine and everything else that's fermented. But the vinegar aided in the pickling process because pickling things is a good way to preserve them, as is packing things in sugar. Sugar is a preservative, and I'm sure they preserve things in oil as well. But, so, we're moving on through uh, time, and you want to try, you want to String some of these, or okay. have you done it before? And you don't have to do it before you're done. Um, yeah, could they? You string apples the same way? Yeah, they they dried lots of different. Apple. We don't have any apples here right now. But like they're upstairs in the servants' quarters. You mm -hmm. have to make sure they're not too close together. Will they? Will they dry? Yeah, you well? have to. Things they have to kind of be spread out in okay. order to dry really well. Because I I oh, kind of more? beans kind of by definition are good to string because it's not too much surface area that mm -hmm. that, that touches. They dried apples. I'm sure that they dried 
peas, there are just about any beans, uh, other than, you know, shell, these are string beans, but shell beans, they would just dry and use the beans, and onions are dried out so they don't spoil. And um, there used to be some okra that was hanging out there. They, they think they're all upstairs. Got they might have been. Anyway, you can dry just about any vegetable and then rehydrate it. The, the more, the juicier the vegetable, the harder it is to get it to dehydrate without properly rotting. without rotting. So, but anyway, so uh, use, I, we when we pickle, we put pickles in, in glass jars. If they would put things, if they pickle things, they left them right in the crock. So the other thing that I was going to show you how to, to make, which is again a fermentation process, is uh, sauerkraut. Now, I'm not sure that the Stevensons being in, of English distraction ate as much sauerkraut as the German people that moved into this area a little bit later on and a little bit further south of here too. But uh, sauerkraut is a good example of how fermentation would preserve vast quantities of cabbages. Now this summer, for instance, I grew 100 heads of cabbage this summer. And if you had 100 heads of cabbage, how could you keep 100 heads of cabbage good mm -hmm. for the whole winter? You could do the digging the trench thing, like I said, but you'd probably have some loss. So it's developed in some countries' culinary traditions to use a fermentation process to make um, sauerkraut. Now this is an, uh, a very specialized kitchen tool. It's called not surprisingly, kraut cutter, because you use it to cut up the, the cabbage. I think if you use, if you look at this, for instance, in a modern kitchen mandolin. appliance, they call it a mandolin. It's ba it's probably it's just basically a mandolin, but most households had one. I don't know whether the Stevensons had one or not. I didn't see one on the inventory, but as I said, they were English and the. People who were Germanic would probably tend to use more. You think the English maybe had the same dish? They just called it something else. Yeah, well, I know. Yeah, that I, the, I know it's like for instance, sure they ate cabbage. Yeah, I don't think they eat quite as much as as the Germans. Exactly. I know that just about every culture has the same recipes. It's exactly. like Hasenpfeffer in in German is mm -hmm. a kind of a rabbit, a kind of a spicy rabbit dish that has ginger snaps and things in it. And in England, it's jugged hair. Right. And if you look at the recipe, they're not particularly different. So, exactly. and, and there's a pancake in just about every cuisine. Mm -hmm. There's a potato pancake in just right. about every cuisine. So, in the in the big picture of things, there is probably a finite number of dishes. It's just that each ethnicity puts their own little twist on it, which is why it's so much fun to go eat other mm -hmm. eat other people's food. <laughs> So anyway, unless you come from my family, nobody cooked. I always said they were going to write it. My family ever wrote a cookbook, but they had one recipe, kill it, boil it, eat it. <laughs> and that would be it. So anyway, if you don't come from a dull family, you can probably have more of a variety. I am a terrible crowd cutter user. I will attempt to. You know who's really good is Sam. Remember Sam? Mm -hmm. He used to come to camp. Yeah, that would help. See, I, I'd take the box off and just do it with my hand. Oh, I was good. I was going to be pure. No, box. I, I, get, I get rid of the box. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to do it with the box on it. Talk about giving somebody a knuckle sandwich. <laughs> <or your enemies. laughs> Yeah, it yeah. does. Well, actually, if I, I make, when I make sauerkraut, I do it in the food processor. So you core it first, oh, and, yeah. then you, and then you did it. Well, anyway, to make a long story short, to finish up my 100 head of cabbage, I ended up with, I think, 48 quarts of sauerkraut. Oh, sauerkraut. So anyway, here is what it looks like when you're done with the uh, crop cutter. So right now, it's slaw. It is indeed. <laughs> so you can have and your some slaw. Mayonnaise and sugar to that. Mm, yeah, there you go. Now, Oh, but I want to eat this in the middle of winter, and if I made coleslaw, that would be pretty raunchy mm -hmm. by the time January or February come around. Now, if you're going to make sauerkraut, the recipe is for every five pounds of shredded cabbage, you use three tablespoons of 
salt. I'm going to have salt and wax. Let's see. Lisa <laughs> Henry Schmidt. And um, thank you. Uh, you use uh, you use canning salt. In the real. This is a different product than the iodized salt you use on the table. Mainly because years ago they discovered that people that lived in this part of the country were all getting goiter because they lived so far from the ocean they weren't eating seafood and they were not getting enough iodine in their diet. So that's when the, 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 the yeah, I don't know who, I got it, maybe it's the Food Drug Administration, I don't know who, but anyway, they started iodizing salt, which is great to eat, but if you use iodized salt when you're canning, everything comes out mushy. So you can, if you want to can stuff, and I'm sure when the people that lived in Stevenson House were canning and preserving things, this is the pre-iodized salt era, mm -hmm. so they would have been using this kind of salt. So, for every five pounds of shredded cabbage, we'll pretend this is five pounds. Do you know how much five pounds of shredded I'm cabbage to take is? A Whoa! A lot of cabbage. Wongo cabbage. So, we'll pretend this is five pounds of cabbage, or five, yeah, five pounds of shredded cabbage. And we're going to put in, if it's five pounds, you'd put in three tablespoons. So, we'll pretend, we'll just put in one tablespoon. So, that's because it's not anywhere near that much. Okay. So, but here's the other important part of, of sauerkraut making or any kind of fermentation process. Somebody would have to take this, and I have the kids to take this kraut tamper and hand it down into the jar like this or the crock so that the cabbage, the fibers of the cabbage start breaking down because the salt in the cabbage when they get kind of pounded around together because of osmosis. And if it's older kids, I talk about osmosis. With the little kids, I just said the water, say the water comes out of the cabbage. But and then when the water, the salt draws the water out of the cabbage, all this liquid comes out, and then it forms lactic acid, I believe, and that's the acid. Because you know how puckery sa sauerkraut mm -hmm. tastes. It tastes acidic. And it's the acid that actually breaks it down and turns it into sauerkraut. And when you make sauerkraut, you're making a big bunch of it, you have to take it and you get it all down in here, and you just work it and work it and work it until all this water starts coming out of it. And when you get it to the point, actually, I do it in a bowl and then dump it into the big crock because I've got so much, you know, you have to do it with your hands. <coughs> and when that water starts coming out that's forming the acid that's going to do the fermentation, you put um, cheesecloth over the whole thing and tuck it all down around the edge with your hands and push it down because it has to uh, be completely covered with that liquid because um, that's, those bacteria are anaerobic. They don't want oxygen near them. So if you ever ask somebody, some old person other than me, how they made sauerkraut when they get it all finished, they put a plate on yeah, it and rock, rock. everybody's heard That's the plate. That's what my grandma rock. did. Yep. And that, the reason they do that is to keep the water above uh, the, the top of the cabbage, otherwise the anaerobic mm -hmm. bacteria will, will croak off and then you'll be up oh, a stump and you're, you'll end up with a big crock full of rotted cabbage, which mm -hmm. is not a culinary good. delight. So, but as time went on, and kind of at the end of the Stevenson's occupation here, canning, more like what we're used to canning, started coming in. So by the 1850s, the canning jar that looks very similar to what we would have today, this one is from 18, this has an 1858 patent date on it. So that, you know, that would be more like what we're used to today. But so you have to remember that the, the other the other kinds of things that I can't demonstrate for food pre preservation was, was smoking. Meat was typically smoked. Now most of the students that you'll run into, regardless of grade level, have read the Little House in the Prairie series, mm -hmm. so they're familiar with Pa smoking the pork inside the hollow tree. Mm -hmm. So and you can tell them if you go out to. Deerbergs when they're barbecuing those chickens outside, you smell that would be the smell you'd smell when stuff was being smoked. So they you can kind of relate it to things that they've experienced just being around town here. So so people dried things, they pickled things, 
They buried things and covered them up, made kind of a root cellar kind of deal. You could either do it in your cellar or let people bid it out in the yard. And if they did the big trench, they would put vegetables in, obviously, in the order that they were grown, because not everything comes in the season at the same time. Mm -hmm. So then when they peel it back, they'd probably get their stuff out in reverse order or else start from both ends and end up in the middle. Yeah? I never thought about putting like leafy vegetables like cabbage in a trench. I thought of root vegetables, yeah, to preserve <laughs> potatoes and beets or whatever. I never thought about putting something like that underground to try and... Cabbages hold up pretty well. Okay. I'm sure they, you know, they, it's just like if you buy a big... Oh, I'm, I'm the queen of buying the big bag of onions when Sam's has them real cheap, mm -hmm. and then by the time you get to the last one, it's like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what is this thing? Who do I don't like? <laughs> but, uh, or a super big bag of potatoes. I'm sure right. they had quite a, I would not be surprised if they had probably a third loss on this stuff. But, you know, if that's all you have at hand, you that's that. what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Short-term preservation in the summertime. I tell you know you tell the kids about hanging stuff down the well because it was a little bit cooler. Mm -hmm. I we don't know whether Stevenson had a spring house or not. Mm -hmm. They might have. Who knows? There's no record that there was one on the place. Mm -hmm. But if you get down to the Pierre Menard house in Ellis Grove, my favorite house in the world, mm -hmm. when I become a millionaire, I'm going to build a duplicate of that house on my property. But anyway, they have a, a spring house, and that would be another way of short-term food okay. prep. And I also think that. Um, Actually, in terms, one advantage of living in the situation that Stevenson sit in a farm situation, and if any of us, you know, remember this from living on farms, that uh, you know, leftovers were not as huge an issue because there was always some animal that would right. eat it. So, mm -hmm. you know, you weren't worried about saving three tablespoons of mashed potatoes in the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. that's it. So, but the, I was stressed with the kids. They things were smoked again, like pop in Little House of the Prairie in the hollow tree. Things were pickled, things were dry, things were root cellared, and I, I had any other way that they could, two things, as I said, were packed in sugar, which is another thing that we can talk about when we're, when we're demonstrating different things, talk about how the kids never know what this is, and sugar cone, and how sugar kept, came in white cones and brown cones, and was extremely expensive so that in big houses that had a servant population, usually the housekeeper or the woman of the house had a big Chatelaine. cluster of chatelaine, it's called, or chatelaine or chantelaine. I always call it a chatelaine. Chatelaine, I thought it was too. But we could be butchering it. Yeah, yeah and chatelaine was just a, kind of a, an elaborate little a way of carrying your keys because they would lock, the sugar was always kept locked because it was this very special commodity, as were most spices. So. And the, there's another one of those myth, myth buster things. People did not use a lot of spice to cover up rotten meat. Nobody in their right mind's dumb enough to eat, eat rotten, rotten meat, meat, no matter how much spice you put on it. So people just like spicy food, as simple as that. I can even remember telling people, and it, it may have been a myth that I propagated, that if you notice all the furniture in the dining room, there are locks on every drawer and every cabinet because things got locked up so they didn't walk away. You know, whether it was your silver, whether it was your spices, you know. They lived in a, a, a different culture, and, and I, this is just a comment. It's not pejorative. It's not racist or anything else. But in a culture where you had people who were in servitude, perhaps unwillingly, you, had, you were running a greater risk of somebody stealing something. Because if you're working, you're forced to work for somebody, and you're not pleased mm -hmm. about it, you're not going to be favorably disposed to... Right. The well, situation. And, and also the the family dining room and the parlor were also his business office, so you had other yeah. people coming in and out of the, the home that weren't necessarily going to treat it the same way that your invited guests would. And exactly. You know, I have uh, I have you know, in terms of chest of drawers in my house, I have no new furniture. Mm -hmm. So everything I have in my house has a lock on every drawer. And somebody told me that new furniture does not Right. Have locks on every drawer. And my mm -hmm. antique furniture also has a lock on drawer. Or yeah, one that locks the whole series of the chest. Yeah. 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 And uh, I have a secretary, and uh, this is not a food preparation thing, but I have a secretary in my front room that was made probably at midnight the last day of the 18th century. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> clink! You know? 
but it has lots of secret compartments in mm -hmm. it. You take out drawers and there are other secret places. It's clearly from a culture where, you, number one, you couldn't run to the bank all the time. Right, right. Number two, your house was probably open more to the public. And maybe three, you had servants that weren't really willing, being, weren't there willingly, so they might have been a little bit more mm -hmm. tempted to, to take something that they understandably felt the pride. So. Does anybody have any questions about any of these things? Okay.